Welcome to another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Many people believe that education can be the silver bullet or the linchpin that can help solve problems like homelessness, drug addiction, social division, and income inequality. And in Hawaii, where our many intertwined cultures cherish our keiki and do all we can to open doors for their successes, we assume that a high priority is placed on having a world-class educational system. But is it? On this show, we talk about the programs available to our keiki, the quality of our facilities and infrastructure, addressing deferred maintenance, increasing the number of cool rooms for our keiki and teachers, a more comprehensive curriculum approach, as well as appropriately recognizing and valuing our teachers and administrative staff. And perhaps most importantly, what life and career opportunities are we providing for our keiki to thrive today and into the future? Today I'm excited to have Senator Michelle Kidani, Chair of the Senate Committee of, uh, on Education, as well as a member of the Committee on Higher Education and Arts. Uh, we will be learning, to some extent, the results of uh, 2016 legislative session, as well as a uh, current preview, perhaps, of the upcoming 2017 legislative session agenda. We'll see what we can learn. Welcome to the show. And Senator, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Carl. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So um, one of the things I like to start the show with a little bit is um, what has driven your interest in, in trying to in being involved with education? Well, certainly, um, you know, as you stated earlier, I think uh, many of us believe that education is, is a very big priority. Um, you will see that uh, in the Senate, we've had a few changes in education chairs over this last decade. In the House, we've had uh, Representative Takumi uh, at the helm of the uh, House Education Committee for probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years. So he's you know, got a jump start on me as to uh, how much he's delved into it. And certainly, it's um, mind boggling. There are so many things that make up uh, educational issues here and how we go about it. Certainly, federal mandates are one of the biggest things. And uh, very many people are really happy that uh, late last year, President uh, Obama signed into law the uh, new Federal Education Act, which is, is called Every Student Succeeds Act, or right. ESSA. Right. So that, that was a big start for us coming you know, into session this year. Um, now the question is, where do we go with that? Exactly, and, uh, exactly. You know, everybody wanted less um, uh, input from the federal uh, government. They wanted uh, them to be there to give us the resources and some guidance on, you know, things that are uh, for equity, et cetera, um, and fairness. But the actual presentation of the education package at home was something that most states uh, felt should be left to the states. And exactly. that, is, that has been a big uh, roadblock for, for many of us um, who, and, and I'm not an educator. So I have to, you know, look to uh, the Department of Education um, and various organizations as well as the Board of Education and others who are interested in education for some of the answers. And, you know, they're not all on the same page. And Surprise. Yeah. They, they never have been. No. So, it, you know, you have to sometimes scratch your head and say, you know, can we all just remember that the end game is to give the best education possible to our yes. students. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, Mr. Daryl Galera a couple of months ago. Daryl's um, excellent. I think he's, I think he's amazing. Um, one of the things that he told us that the governor gave him a direction uh, to go tabla rasa, to go blank slate, and what should it look like? Um, is, uh, I think that's an exciting thing, and it's, it's specifically. As we look as a state in Hawaii, when we see the challenges, um, I'm, um, as you might be aware, I don't know, um, I've had the uh, fortune of being able to have a daughter in charter school, a son in private school, Kamehameha schools, and a daughter in public school. So I've actually got been the able, whole gamut, I huh? get to see the differences, <laughs> and I get to see what's happening in, in each location and what some of the challenges are. And recognizing that, you know what, that isn't the only difference. 
you've got schools, some schools that seem to benefit more than others from some programs or their proximity to military bases to a certain extent as well. So some schools seem to have more funding and, and more attention than others. And um, would you say that some of that, and it's just, this is, I don't want to put you on the spot too much here, but would you say that some of that is subject to the effectiveness of the legislators in those districts? Or is it, or, or, or how would you suggest that works? Well, if you're talking things? programming, Carl, no, it's not. It's, it's right. the Board of Education and the Department of Education that dictates what happens um, outside of federal mandates. Yes. Um, now that we're going to have um, the No Child Left Behind gone and our ESSA you know, comes on board, we yes. expect less federal mandates. But how you deliver in the classroom is really up to the BOE and DOE, and that's where we all need to get on the same page. Agreed. Because even in Hawaii, and, and by the way, let me make this point. Hawaii is the only state in the nation that is only a state educational agency. We don't have a, a local educational agency. We're the only state in the nation that fully pays for public education. All the other states in the nation, the counties are responsible and they pay for education through real property taxes. Yes. So if you go to the mainland, you find that the property taxes are higher. That's because it includes the educational costs where we don't have that here. And our real property taxes here are quite, quite low, actually. Right, comparative. And that's, and that's because they don't have the, uh, the cost of education. So given that, we do still have much differences in our schools. Mm -hmm. Certainly rural schools and schools that have um, more needs because you have home, more homeless, you have more English learners, um, and you have um, teachers that are substitute teachers and really not certified to be in the classroom. Uh, yes, about a thousand and for of them me, every year at the moment. That's right. So what are we yeah. doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I'd like to know the answer to that too. One of the things I'll tell you that I'm doing okay, good. is that I have been pushing the university and I uh, just recently met with the University of West Oahu to, to look at providing more programs so we can uh, certify teachers. We okay. have lots of educational assistants who have been doing this job for years and they won't go and get their teaching degree because they can't afford to quit being an EA. Right. And then, and, and these are normally in, in the high turnover schools where yeah. the teachers every year, you lose, you know, 40% of your teachers or, you know, the, the, the ones that we lose come from the same area every year. I've been tracking this. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, so Leeward Coast, Central Oahu, uh, West Oahu, about 40% turnover. Wow. So, is there when we get new teachers, I don't think you want to put brand new teachers in these hard to fill areas. I, I think there's truth there. You I know? think there's truth there. But it, do we have a have we been able to discern why there's such a high turnover in those areas? Is it is well, it? number one, again, they have to bring in a lot of teachers from the mainland, and I'm not saying they're not qualified. Mm. I think that it's culture shock. Yeah. Okay. And we know even at the top uh, levels of the University of Hawaii, when you bring uh, people in from the mainland at the helm, they have a hard time adjusting. And Absolutely. Yeah. And <laughs> so it's the same thing with teachers. Exactly. I mean, you can't really understand until you've been here a while, uh, and, at least a few years, to really correct. know how things work. Here. So if you add to that the issue that maybe we're not mentoring the teachers as well as we should be, we're not giving the teachers the incentives that we should give them, the cost of living, the cost of housing is so expensive. So at the state level, we need to be doing more. We need to build dormitories, and I am pushing for uh, funding to build uh, not just student, but faculty and teacher Agreed. dormitories. UH West needs Oahu, a lot of help there. Where, where West Oahu has a lot of room on the campus. Yeah. But, you know, that would help with some of the, the culture shock and the living expense types. Yeah, but agree. at the very bottom, of the rung is how we pay our teachers and how we look at them as a priority. And more recently in the news was that uh, the Department of Education was asking for a four and a half percent raise for some of their upper echelon uh, administrators uh -huh. right. and, and the board uh, uh, put it on hold until they could get a, a better view of it because one of the very newest uh, board members, uh, Kenneth Uemura, who happens to be a classmate of mine, 
you know, questioned uh, what's the rationale of doing an across the board shouldn't be based on merit. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's the same thing with the teachers. Well, while we don't have the funding now, we have to find a way to find the funding. Great. We have to find a way to continue to give uh, incentives for our teachers. And we did that, you know, um, last year and the year before by putting money in the budget to give them additional funding if they were in a hard to fill school, if they took and kept their national certification um, and those things. And then once the school becomes, um, you know, in their uh, commits to their AYP, don't yank the teacher and stop paying them because they, they are what brought that school up to standard. Right, right, right. But AYP, what's AYP? It's annual yearly progression. It's to s performance to see that they are meeting all, all the goals. Right. Um, okay. yeah. So those were some of the things that kind of bugged me is that you, you yeah. get a teacher in there, you pay them extra, and as soon as the, the school is performing, then you stop, you know, giving them the incentive. So right. You know, so then the school move. goes back down. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Then you start but the problem all over again. One of the things that you stated is, is yes, we have a, we are the only state that actually has a centralized management system for the entire school system. That would suggest that there's opportunity to have an equal balance. So, where's the disconnect between having a standard equal balance and knowing that schools next to each other are very disparate in, 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 in what is available to them. Yeah. You know, if you look at some of the mainland schools, and um, I don't see that more money always equals better performance because it still comes down to the classroom and the administrators and do if they have the heart for the job. But given that, you do have to give them the tools to work with. And a lot of them are screaming for uh, professional development, mentoring, and I'm not seeing that happen. And in fact, um, you know, when I look at uh, some of the teachers who have done really well, won Milken Awards, et cetera, um, they soon go and they do other things and they, they're not in teaching anymore. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I really would love to see them uh, stay in the classrooms and mentor you know, the other teachers. And um, I, I think those are some of the things that I feel is important. Yeah. And so our students can connect. And, and I think one of the things, especially on the Leeward Coast, is that the students don't seem to be connecting to their teachers because they don't know if they'll be there next year. That's an important, that's an continuity, continuity. So we, right. it's already time for that break. <laughs> so we're already ready for a quick break. So, okay, let me say thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm your host, Carl Campagna. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Let me say again, thank you to Senator Michelle Kadani for in, uh, joining us today. And uh, we'll be back in one minute. Thank you. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Pete McGinnis-Mark to talk about HIGP and research in Manoa. What about that show, Pete? I think it's great, Jay. Research at Manoa really provides faculty members at the University of Hawaii with an easy way of explaining some of the research activities we're conducting on the campus. For example, I do a lot of space research, whether it's the Moon and Mars, but many of my other colleagues do other interesting kinds of work, whether it's exploring the ocean floor in submarines, studying earthquakes and tsunamis, or other activities. So research at Manoa really provides us with a way of telling the general public some of the activities which we're involved in, as well as communicating to our colleagues and students. This is a fun science, and we really appreciate the activities which Research of Manoa enable us to talk about. I love Research of Manoa. Come around, join us. It's Monday, 1 o'clock p.m., every single Monday. Be there or be square. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming back. Um, again, my name is Carl Campagna. I'm your host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. And yes, we have Senator Michelle Kadani, Chair of the Education Committee, uh, here with us today. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so let's jump in uh, a little bit back uh, into the funding thing, as we were just mentioning. There's different schools have different funding levels for different reasons. So um, just as we were off air, you were mentioning several different categories. So run through those again, if you would. Well, the weighted student formula is really based on a, a baseline amount for each school. If you're elementary, if you're a middle school, or if you're a high school, you get a different amount, baseline. Now you take the number of students, and each student gets a number. So the, the more students you have in the school, the oh. more funding you're going to get, because that number is tied to, 
to the student. So roughly, maybe the average is 6,000 something per student. But if you, you are in a community that has a high, uh, low income population, you'll get additional funds. Okay. If you're in a community where you have many uh, immigrants or English learners, you get an additional uh, Okay. bite of the pie, so okay. to speak. In, in addition to if you have, special education. If you have special education students, you, that's another bite of the sure, pie. Sure, sure. I think it's interesting to, to note that maybe 11% of our student population are special ed with disabilities, you know, and um, fortunately we're in a democracy that we try to provide um, as much education and as equal education as we can for those students. But because of the cost of it, it takes a, almost 25% of the Department of Education's budget for that 11% of the students. So their, their needs cost us almost twice as much as the other students. And at that, um, we don't have enough teachers that are qualified to teach that. That's correct. As well. I mean, talk about we the... We don't have enough qualified teachers, period. Not enough qualified teachers, period. And then especially in some of the specialty areas, such as special education, um, <clears throat> and then that opens the door to other questions such as, well, why is it that some schools, some public schools, still have art and music programs and others don't? Mm -hmm. Who makes that determination? That's, of, that determination is made by the principal. By the principal. They still do have some, <laughs> some say in, in what happens at their school. So, you know, you may have a, you know, you know and, and art and sciences are, are all very important things. The, yes, the they new, are. The new ESSA uh, yeah. legislation does... Um, put more weight on that, and they encourage that. They they okay. do have more funding for that. Have a comprehensive um, approach. Correct, and you know, uh, you know, when I was going to school and elementary school, I remember uh, my teacher also played the piano. You know, and it starts giving you a love for for music, yeah. other things, and I think it's really important at a young age for uh, students to have other interests. You know, um, absolutely. Uh, other areas that aren't really covered that I think have been in the past, or at least there's been discussions on include vocational education and when we would start more vocational education at what age how we can bring that back in one of the thoughts that I had was um, and actually one of the bills that I actually sent your way or at least an idea was uh, can we get some of our veterans to get through and be certified teachers a program to create certified teachers for our veterans to teach some of these vocational classes because some of them are here and they're very qualified so how can we do that well, actually, the Department of Education always, you know, they have partnered and they still do. And it's just a matter of whether or not you're qualified to teach the class. Um, we do have substitute teachers. They can, they can come in as a substitute if they would like to do that. Um, but I do encourage them to do so because they, they do bring value just as um, um, many of our, our teachers who have retired, if they want to come back and substitute, you know, we, we do welcome that. Um, I, I have... Um, one of the, the bills that we passed uh, this session, you know, looked at um, the SPED students and, you know, we had passed an act before, but we never funded it. So at least now we will uh, fund a position, you know, and uh, have uh, ways that we can monitor mm -hmm. and we can include resource training for the teachers who are in uh, SPED classrooms um, so that they have a, a better idea of uh, how to handle some of these um, things. We have, you know, different needs and, and that's part of the cost is that we also have liabilities because right. teachers don't know how to handle certain things and it's not their fault, they've, they've not been trained. Well, and that's what, it, what has come up on this show time and time again is how much we put on our teachers, how much we expect out of our teachers. Um, going from being able to identify an epileptic seizure to potential drug use, uh, really the full, whether their eyesight is, is really working very well and if they are able to notice that maybe this person needs an, an eye assessment. Mm -hmm. All of these extra things, in addition to, by the way, keep those children engaged, keep them moving forward. So much that we put on our teachers for the relative little amount that we pay them. Um, I, I totally it, agree with yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> it's not really fair when you put that, when we put so much pressure on our teachers and then blame them at the same time when it's not really in their control. And that's one of the things that, that really um, we think, that, okay, it's every student succeeds act, that we believe that that can open the door to, we can. to making a change. We can. But, you know, 
And this is why um, the governor put together the ESSA task force, which Daryl Galera probably talked about. And yeah. I, I think there's 19 of us on the task force, right. and I am also on the task force. Yeah. And there is just so much to learn. Yes. But that's why you know we're doing this to get everybody's input and try to be a, on the same page as much as possible because, you know, DOE, BOE, and and certainly the legislators have, have different ideas of, uh, you know, how we're going to spend the money. Right, and where. You know, right, <laughs> and where. And, you know, this goes even to mm -hmm. the, uh, the bill that we passed for the $100 million for Cool the Schools. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we thought we had an um, estimate that was going to work for us, and when it finally went out to bid, it came in four times higher than what we expected. See, that's one of the questions that I would also have. Um, I have... I have significant years of experience doing construction and project management, and I have been curious about not at the, the government level. Not at the government level, but I yeah. have actually. I've been work. I've worked on federal and state procurement projects, so I've seen some of the, I guess, challenges that exist there. And there are there seem to be inconsistencies sometimes in the procurement aspect, um, whether it's the contracting of the contractors and their and those contracts themselves, and how they're somewhat inconsistent. And then there's the actual procurement portion of materials and how that gets done and where that gets done. And, um, there are challenges and inconsistencies there. And then there's the permitting. The permitting process seems to also be very inconsistent based on what it is you're trying to accomplish and sometimes based on who's reviewing the plans. Mm -hmm. So these are all areas that... I'm not a procurement specialist, so I, I won't pretend to tell you that I know what's going on. But I yeah. do know that that is... Um, a big issue yeah uh, and I've seen it in other things and and sometimes um, because of our law uh, we have to if someone cries foul then everything stops and they yeah. sometimes have to start again which drags the project out mm -hmm. and as we are seeing now we're in a big construction broom, boom so you know the, the contractors um, will bid higher because the time and the, the manpower is at a premium right now. Yep. You know, a couple years ago, four years ago, when I was doing the uh, CIP budget for, for the Senate, we did hundreds of millions of dollars in projects that, you know, some of them are only now starting up. But had we done it back then and been able to rush through this, we would have had it at a cheaper cost That's because right. everybody wanted work. That's right. Yeah, now everybody exactly. has work, and they really don't need your project. Do you we know? need to not have easy opt-out clauses in these contracts yeah. as well? I don't know exactly what we need, but I think we need an overhaul of our procurement. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. You know. Agreed. I, I had the fortune of being able to spend some time um, in the Farm to School uh, Plus working group. And through that, um, I got to sit down at first and just listen. Mm -hmm. And we had um, uh, Senator Chen Oakland was there. Um, Senator Ruderman was there at one point. Um, there were a couple of representatives that I think, uh, you know, H House of Representatives, people that sent their people that they didn't show up themselves, but they were all there. We had Department of Education, we had CTAR, uh, we had Nutrition Program, we had USDA, we had Farmers Bureau, we had Farmers Union, all these people at the table. And I was sitting back, just, I'm not a farmer, but okay, I'll listen. And I found out in, in a hurry that no one at that table actually spoke the same language and it was a language of procurement. Mm -hmm. And no one at that table, no one invited the state procurement office. And no one invited the state procurement specialist in DOE. And I found out why. There wasn't one. Oh, I did not know that. The, the current person, I'm not sure if that's changed, but the person who was there at that time was acting and didn't actually do anything. And I asked for the most recent RFP and they said, well, we haven't done one in three years. And it was an omnibus RFP, which for, for those who don't know, that means you have to bid on everything, 100% of it. So if you can't bid on 100% of it, you can't bid. So immediately I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, there's certainly it is, you know, how you present the, the request for proposal, how you break it out or don't break it out. Right, right, right. Um, the state procurement um, officer is very well informed, very yes. versed. She's very intelligent. Yes, and Sarah I Allen. think correct Sarah Allen and I think she can help us with uh, maybe trying to revamp um, you know and it's not that I think the DOE is perfect because I have called them out on procurement issues which um, you know the state procurement officer looked into for us but there are many things that uh, 
we, we should, you know, Agreed. be taking a look at. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Well, we, I, I felt very happy that we were able to get Sarah Allen there. Mm -hmm. And she was able to lay out a few things. Yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do that. And I'm surprised you're not doing that already kind of a thing. So that was actually very helpful. And that's what helped achieve, at that time, the bill that we were able to put out that passed was the hiring of the Farm to School Coordinator. Um, who started a year and a half yes, ago. Yes, that, that was a really good ad. You know, yeah. uh, Senator De La Cruz and I, Donovan De La Cruz, um, who's also very passionate about education, we took time when we were in Chicago last week at the conference for the National Legislative uh, Conference um, to go visit two 21st century schools and to see, you know, how they did, uh, how they built, et cetera. And it was really, really um, a good experience. So we at that time also looked at procurement issues yes. and how they were able to do things. So that's something that we've got, you know, on the back burner, waiting Absolutely. for the right time to bring Absolutely. forward. And we are going to talk about well, it. Let me know how I can help that. Because uh, I would it. love to continue my help and my support and as much as I can give, uh, I would love to be uh, a part of that. Um, so I, we unfortunately are really close to the end, but what I wanted to do is we didn't get to everything. We didn't get to talk in a bit more in depth uh, about ESSA. Um, and we didn't get to talk about your, some of your thoughts, a preview of, of, of next session's legislative agenda. So uh, what I would like to do is close the show with what you would like us to know as far as ESSA, next year's agenda, what you want to make sure that we are thinking about and we are focusing on from the general public's perspective. Well, the federal government has tasked us to have whatever we're going to do with our, our new rulings to have it ready for implementation at the next school year. So we have to make sure that all of us, the Board of Education, the Department of Education, and the state legislators have some agreement as to how we want to move. And, and I think that is also for all stakeholders. That's the students and the parents. So certainly if you're out there and you've not had a chance to give input, there are various task force meetings happening around the community. So please you know, take the time to go. If you can't make it, at yeah. least send in a question, a comment, or something. Um, I, it's your government. Take advantage of it. I, I agree with that completely. And the more engagement and involvement we have, the better we are uh, in many cases. Um, the next one that I'm aware of, that I know that I'm attending, is coming up in September. I believe it's September 14th, and it's at Mualua High School. So I encourage and invite everyone uh, to come to that one, uh, certainly who lives in that area. Um, but then look for, and you can go online, um, I, I believe you can go on to the Department of Education uh, website and find where we have more of these coming up for your communities. So I think that that's a huge piece. So involvement, engagement, be there. So thank you so much, Senator, for joining us. This You're was very welcome. too Thanks short of a conversation. Me. It went by quickly. It really did, it really did. So thank you for joining us as well. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Uh, next week, we're hoping to have uh, Mr. Matthew Lynch, the current sustainability coordinator for the University of Hawaii. We're looking to hear from him what he's trying to accomplish at the university. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Take care.